I believe Brianna or Courtney are online this morning to monitor attendance if you're wanting the two hours of CE credit. Um, but remember, you have to have your video on. So there's a number of you that do not show video on and you'll need the video playing. We've got to see your smiling faces in order to know that you're truly there and in attendance and in order to get credit. So just a reminder to turn your video on if you're wanting credit. We're at 71 and climbing, Mr. Lance. Yeah, we'll wait one more minute and then uh, we'll be out of here early today. So uh, let's just give it one more minute. Man, it got quiet in here. Everyone's so focused now. All right, we'll get we'll just get started. We've got 74 on, and uh, hopefully the remainings will click on in the next few minutes if they're wanting to attend. Um, thanks for everybody being here today. It's uh, we, we we taught this class yesterday. Uh, many of you know we we had a oh what did we have some sort of a forms class. Um, here a, a week and a half ago with Will Cooper and there were about 108 people in attendance and uh, we jokingly said that the minute the division knew that Will was teaching to 100 people they shut us down and uh, only gave us an option for 30. Um, and then of course 10 minutes after yesterday's class uh, they sent an email from the division saying hey Lance we heard your class was so great we're okay if you guys want to kick it back up to 100 people. So um, we're glad that we could fit everybody in today uh, for the CE credit. And um, I'm gonna take as much credit for that at the division as I can. Um, but again, it's good to be with you. Uh, you know, uh, buenos dias. I don't speak much Spanish, but I do know that uh, buenos dias means high five. So high five to you guys. And I'm um, looking forward to today's class. Um, there's a few things we're gonna go through. As you know, it's a two hour CE class. And in that class, we're allowed to take two 10 minute breaks. So we're gonna kind of just run through the material today. Um, you're gonna to notice I'm looking over my screen. I've got a screen behind me that's got uh, faces of many of you on it. So, um, but uh, we'll try to be out of here by 11.45. Um, and that'll give us some time for a little bit of our late start, the five minutes, but uh, in time to, to definitely be out early before 12. Um, Joe is gonna help monitor the chat session. So as we go, as you know, um, you're on mute. Um, but I also want to give you guys the chance to be unmuted and a chance to speak and ask questions so that we can keep it a little more engaging. Otherwise, I'm going to feel like Jimmy Fallon and uh, laughing at my own comments and jokes. And it, that's kind of tough, I've uh, noticed. So um, feel free to type some questions in there. Joe will find you in our, our, our group of people and we'll unmute you so you can ask questions. Um, and then again, Brianna and Courtney, one of them that's online today will help monitor attendance to make sure that you're present. Again, there's a few of you that do not have your video links on and we need your video link on so that we know that you are here and attentive. Um, Lance, there, sorry, Lance, there are, a couple, there are a couple people that are attending, they know they're not getting credit. So there are some, just, Perfect. just FYI. Okay. And is, did Steve Jr. get on today, do we know? I didn't see him show up, but I wanted to double check. I don't see him in the list. Say that again, Jamie. Yes, it's Jamie. He's actually using my uh, um, login right now, but Perfect. he's actually jumped on another call. So he no problem. Back. No problem at all. I just, we've got him slated for a 10 minute recap at the end of this class. And so I just want to make sure that he's there and present. So thank you. Um, let's get started. We're going to implement some polls today. And so just to get you familiar with the polls, um, I'm going to send this one out and uh, this should hit your screen. You should see that somewhere on your screen. Uh, we've got a number of these, uh, seven or eight of them today, but go ahead and fill it out and then I'll share the results and we'll get used to uh, looking at this throughout our class day.
Lance, we need to get that sound bite. Do, 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 yeah. do, do, do. I'll be on that I mean, next this time. The, this, this is probably the easiest question of the day. So um, I'm a little surprised it's taking so long, but just select which office you're out of. That's all. Just a quick share. We're going to end this poll no matter what. 91% of you voted um, and we'll share this. So here's a little recap of what that'll look like today. Um, just gives you an idea. We've got somebody from almost every office uh, attending, uh, obviously a large number from Salt Lake and Park City. So we've got a few questions. Um, all of these uh, polls today are anonymous. So on my end, I can't see who's replied, who hasn't replied. Um, all I can see is that basically the, what you're on the screen right now, I just get to see them coming in. So um, we'll continue to go through those. And I've got one more I want to share uh, as well as we, you know, we'll have a bunch of these today. Um, little outline of what we're going to cover today. I'm going to talk uh, quite a bit about the new construction REPSI, just the standard state approved REPSI. And then we're going to cover some builder addendums um, and we're going to go through how those tie together. Um, you know, a lot of times the phone call or the question in a class like this is, hey, look at Lance, what can I do to help protect my buyer um, in a transaction with a builder? And unfortunately, I don't have a good answer for you. Um, I don't have some magic potion today or some information that I can share that is going to 100% protect you um, and a buyer you represent with a builder. Um, I think what's most important is that we educate our buyers on the process, uh, that we prepare them emotionally for this event, um, that we help them understand that the dates are rarely met, if ever, and that there's a lot of ebb and flow in the selections that are chosen and the process Function. Um, it always starts off maybe a little slower than expected and our buyers end up getting frustrated along the way. And so um, we refer to this as kind of the new construction process as an art and a science when it comes to you guys representing uh, buyers. Um, however, we also are going to represent, um, you know, a lot of builders in this, um, in builders and developers. So today's new construction reps you're going to find rarely works with a lot of developers maybe resort projects like in Park City. They've got their own documents, their own information. Uh, hold on, give me guys two seconds. Sorry guys, had to deal with the technical issue. Um, and so you're gonna say, well, shoot, even if I go to DR Horton or Ivory Homes or some other national builder or, or large local builder, they don't use a new construction repsy either. That's okay. Most of the items we're going to cover today, I would say probably 95% of the items um, are in the documents we're going to cover, specifically translate to those builder documents. So we're going to talk about a lot of different items and, and those events then will translate into what you're used to doing with new construction. So um, with that said, I want to get started um, with one more uh, item here. Uh, I want to get you to answer this question for me. In the last 18 months, have you done a new home transaction on a new construction REPC? You know, it's apparent that if I have a yes or no question, you guys answer faster than the office you're in. So we'll try to keep these simple today as much as we can. All right, and we're gonna end this poll and we'll share these results. So 40, 62% said no, 38% yes. Yesterday's class was really close to 50-50, so it doesn't surprise me. Again, there'll be a lot of information. Um, in the original email I sent out, there was an ability to print the new construction REPSI in parts. Um, if you had a chance to do that, fantastic. It'll just give you a little more room if you wanna write some notes down. Um, but you'll be able to go through looking at one. I would highly recommend looking at one or, or a place you can write notes. And then what we will do is um, I'll still have it on my screen. So with that said, let's jump into some of our topics today. Um, let me share my screen here. And we'll pick this one. And can everybody see that? Thumbs up, you can see my screen. Fantastic. Yep, All right, so let's dive into some of this. Um, let me make this a little bigger if I can. So 
a little slow on my end. Let's see if we can. All right, so let's start. We're going to start at the top. Yesterday I bounced around. Um, I'm, I'm going to. I'm, we're going to start kind of at the top. I'm going to actually scroll all the way down, and we're going to begin today's class at the end of the new construction repsy, and then we're going to go to the very top, and we're going to start from the top down. And I think it will help make sense to this. We're going to start with contract deadlines. One of the things that you're going to notice um, on the new construction repsy that is uniquely different to any normal repsy. Um, Throw it in your chat. Let me grab my chat session here and, and let's make sure we're using this. If I can find it. Um, I do not have my chat up here, Joe. Let's see. Just uh, on the bottom of your share screen, uh, Lance, press that chat button twice. It should pop out automatically. Huh. It's not on there. On your uh, on the bar that you're using oh, to do the go. share? Yeah. Go. I got it. Let me get this out of here. Okay, so a couple of things that um, you're gonna find that are, are not on here, we'll just, we'll keep moving. Um, the dates are gonna be different. So a couple of quick notes on, on dates and then I think most of the contract will follow into these dates. 24B and 24C, I like to keep the same date whenever I can. I try to make that what I would refer to as a drop dead date. I want my buyer to have all their due diligence, all their documents, all their reviewing. I want them to be able to see their plans, their specs, their features. And, I, and then I wanna collect that non-refundable deposit as well at pre-construction meeting. And we'll get into all the details of this, but um, I, it, when, when I can, I like to have B and C the same. And then that allows me to have one date, one check, a kind of a go date. Um, you're gonna find that some builders like to stage that a little differently. We'll talk about that as well. Um, because they want a little, maybe a little skin in the game prior to um, some of these dates. Um, but two things you're going to notice. Um, there's no really, there's a substantial completion date, but there's really no date for a settlement deadline. Everything's based on a number of days after. So you'll notice right here, it's got a number of days. We're, we're going to fill in how many days after substantial completion. And um, so substantial completion is going to be this novel date that we talk about that the state approved Rep C likes to have a date in there, but every builder I know won't put one in there. Um, they'll, they'll modify this in an addendum, um, but we're going to talk a lot today about substantial completion and how that date is a moving target. And if you've done new construction, you're going to realize it's a pretty big moving target. The other item, any, anybody know what else is not on there that typically would be in a Rep C? What's an item that's glaring that is missing from uh, this, this contract deadline? Final walkthrough. No, final walkthrough is going to show up in the contract in a different area. There we oh. go. Allison Remus Snyder, appraisal. The appraisal deadline is non-existent in a new construction repsy um, or a finance deadline as well. I mean, those two, that, you know, I don't even, I mean, I would take a guess that I don't even believe the word appraisal shows up in the state approved new construction repsy. It's implied in a prequal letter that we'll talk about under the financing option. Uh, but those are some things you need to be aware of with your buyers that appraisals just do not apply. And frankly, to the builder, they don't matter. They're gonna expect your buyer to close when the home is done based on the substantial completion date. So with that said, and as we use those dates, we're gonna go back to the top of the agreement and we're gonna start at the very top and we've got an option in, you know, right at the top of every, every REPC, an option for um, earnest money. I'm going to ask you the question in your mind. Sorry about that. In your mind, what's more important, earnest money or construction deposit? Again, I cannot see your answers uh, individually. So... Sometimes I wish I could, I could call you out and question what you're thinking, um, but that's not on the schedule today. Well, and if you have a really a compelling thing you wanna say, go ahead and use the icon to raise your hand and we can pick you that way as well. Yeah, my screen's only gonna show me about 50 people that are in, so there's a couple of screens here, so it'll take me a minute to find you. And I gotta say, you know, kudos to you guys. I mean, um, you know, 120 people registered. I'm trying to figure out if you guys are sick from COVID. 
on a Friday morning to sign up for a two hour class on forms. I know Jim Lee is, but, but for the rest of you, I just, I wonder what is going on. So uh, yes, kudos uh, to you. Grace Berry again, has a comment. Buenos dias. Buenos, Buenos dias. dias. Lance, Grace Berry has a comment. You bet. Well, I, I think the construction deposit is more important. So Grace, can you see the poll on your screen? There should be a poll for you to select an answer for you. I'm going to end this poll. Okay, I will give you the can. results and we'll share these. And 82% said the construction deposit. I would agree. Um, I think in a new construction REPC deal, earnest money is kind of almost irrelevant. Um, I've seen earnest monies with builders as low as 100 bucks. Um, it's not uncommon to see 500 bucks or 1,000 bucks or maybe 2,000. What I find more often is whatever they charge. Um, for their reservation deposit that they might use, oftentimes gets transferred over as earnest money. Not always, but, but that's probably a pretty normal way to deal with that. So you could have a, maybe a $2,000 earnest money and you could have a $40,000, $50,000 construction deposit. Um, in Park City, you could have a 10,000 earnest money and a $200,000 construction deposit. Um, or non-refundable deposit based on the future of a resort deal. So it's kind of across the board, but um, I would agree that's, that's um, it's a big deal as we start talking about this. So let's dive into this contract. We're gonna skip over some of the items I'm gonna skip over today. We're not gonna read every word. Um, and there's obviously a lot of crossover between both RETCs. Um, but my hope is to share with you a few things uh, to be aware of as you are representing buyers. And I think as well as if you're representing a seller, Again, keep in mind, this is going to be more bread and butter um, homes. So one home, two homes, uh, working with a builder, a little more traditional stuff. So we're going to jump into property. And um, pretty standard at the top of this. Uh, let's make sure I've got everything in here. Um, normal things at the top here, cities, you know, states, uh, lot number, subdivision. Includes the lot or does not include a lot. That really just depends on whether your client's already closed a lot and now uh, hiring a builder to build a home for them. Again, I don't know that they'll use this agreement very often. Most builders have their own fee build agreement. Um, but again, the state tried to use this new construction REPSI for all types of new construction. Um, everything from, uh, you know, the one house um, owner build to, uh, you know, with a, with a contractor uh, up to a project. So. Couple items to point out though, additional improvements. Item 1.3B right here. We've got this dedicated paved road and private paved road. I think a lot of times we like to assume that if it is a planned unit development or has a, an HOA associated with the development um, that it's most of the time gonna be private paved roads. And you're probably right. However, um, what I do wanna make sure we do is spend some time and um, and make sure that uh, sometimes it could be dedicated. We have had PUD projects and developments that have dedicated roads. That's a big deal in the HOA fee. Um, but uh, I just realized I'm gonna I'm gonna step back on one thing here. I wanna I wanna I wanna pull something up real quick. Let me start over, or let me just back up one thing and say if you if you're working with a buyer, and your buyer says, hey, look, if we want to go out and buy a new home. Um, we want to write an offer on this property here. I'm hoping you can see that. I shrunk it down a little bit so it'll fit on the screen. If this was the property they sent you that they wanted to buy, which REPSI would you use? Would you use a standard REPSI or would you use a new construction REPSI? And I'm going to launch a poll right here and let you guys decide. So let me slide, you can slide that window out of the way if it's covering the screen. Um, but uh, standard REPSI or new construction REPSI. Of course, I've got an option for an old six page carbon copy REPSI there if you feel like that's a, a better option for you. A couple of things I look at in this. I mean, obviously it has days on market. Um, it, has, um, it has a construction status. Um, it's got some stuff in the, uh, in the remarks down below, but uh, throw, your, throw your poll in there and, and then we'll get back to a few of the questions that are popping up here and, and what you might think.
I see some of you squinting hard, really trying to look at the details here. It's kind of neat to see everybody's face move up closer to the camera. So they're engaged for sure. They are. I'm going to end this poll. I don't want to. I, go ahead, Joe. Amanda Davis has a question. Does it have the CO? Yeah, well, that's the magic question, right? So here's your results. Um, and it shows that, you know, initially 78% said, hey, would use a standard REPC. Now, this is kind of a catch-22, and it's something we need to be aware of. You would think, um, you know, we have agents say, well, the construction status located right here, Lance says it's built and standing. But the truth is, I don't know that that matters. We have a lot of agents that walk out to their homes that they're representing a builder on, and they see that it's carpeted, they see that it's done, the builder tells them it's done, um, and it looks like it's done. And so they change it on the MLS because they don't want it to show it's under construction. They want to show that it's built and ready. But that doesn't necessarily mean that there is a certificate of occupancy. And a few of you put that in there. Hey, look, I got to know if there's a C of O. That is a magic question. You would assume down in the remarks down here where it says, hey, the estimated completion date is March 15th. But you would also think if you're the agent representing the builder on this, you'd probably pull that out if it was already done. So there's a lot of things in this MLS printout that would lead you to believe that it is built, standing, and done. But the only way to really know is to ask the agent. Ask the agent, ask the owner. Um, it's important to know which REPC you're using or if there's a C of O because it, remember, it's a state law to use a standard REPC only after a certificate of occupancy has been issued. So if you're representing a buyer, you're going to ask the agent, hey, does this home already have a certificate of occupancy? If they, and if they say absolutely, say, hey, any chance you could forward me a copy of it so that you have it. If you're representing a builder um, and the builder says it's done, you're going to say, hey, look, um, does this have a C of O? Because if you get a call from a buyer's agent and they want to write an offer, you want to help guide them on which reps to use. The worst thing you can do is get a standard REPC on a home that you believe is done. And the new construction REPC uh, should have been used because you're going to have to kick that back legally to the agent and tell them to redraft it. And you don't want them to feel bad or look bad to their client. It happens more often than you think. So that's why I want to make sure we have the discussion on this. Um, so make sure you know which REPC you're using um, so that we don't hang out our agent friends and we get the stuff on the right forms in the beginning. So back to, well, let me get this out of the way. Oh, let's see here. I gotta get this right here. So back to these parts. So going down the list, we've got standard stuff with permits and fees and one four, builders gonna pay permits and fees, um, impact fees, landscape bonds and connection fees. I want you to highlight or make a note of landscape bonds, 1.4. That is something that oftentimes gets glossed over and not thought about, but it's a big deal. If you've ever sold, let's say a, a new entry level home, there are a number of builders that do not include landscaping, um, not even front yard landscaping, and they allow the buyer to put it in themselves. And so their, their marketing documents will say, hey, landscaping's not included. However, um, how does cities mandate that landscaping will be done within a 12 month period? They require a small bond and it could just be a thousand bucks or 2000 bucks or something nominal. Um, but there's always a discrepancy in this. If you're selling a home that does not include landscaping, but it has a time frame for it to be installed. Many times the city may require a landscape bond. And then you get down to the end of closing and your buyer's got to pay a one or $2,000 bond fee. And it says here that the seller's paying for it. And then we have this dispute that the seller's saying, well, I'm not paying for the bond for, for, so that you can meet your deadline and I lose my money if you don't put it in, you gotta pay it. And there's a misunderstanding in the middle of this that often gets lost. So keep that in mind on the landscape bonds. Um, it's something that can create a problem at the end for closing. Um, 1.5 uh, water service. Um, pretty much, you know, you're going to get a normal connection fee in any normal subdivision. Uh, keep in mind, this is very specific to the legal source of water. So it's just to protect a buyer from not being stuck buying a home without a legal source of water. 
It does not mean if you write an offer on a piece of property or a lot and you call uh, the water district and they tell you there's a water share that is attached to it. It does not mean you're going to get that. It's personal property, as we know. Um, a developer may have not pulled it off. Maybe they're still working on, a, on, uh, on some plat issues. Um, it has not been removed. So that does not deal with water share specifically. And then in survey 1.6, um, obviously it says the seller is going to stake and mark all the corners um, as well. It also says that at closing, those stakes are still going to be in place. So make sure you make a note when you're doing your walkthrough with the buyer, um, when they're doing all the items in a home, we want to make sure that those property corners are still marked. Most of the time, it's just uh, possibly some side yard or rear yard. The front ones are typically pinned in a sidewalk or front curb um, or something uh, a little more permanent. But nonetheless, let's make sure that's there, especially if they're going to be putting a fence in um, at a future date. We want to make sure that's uh, handled in, in the beginning. Any questions so far? I see a note in here, uh, private to me, just asking why the construction deposit's more important. Um, we're going to cover that here coming up. So I'll get to some of those. Purchase price. Um, let's see here. Make sure I don't miss anything. And just to avoid missing a question, uh, go ahead and just type those either to me or to the overall group chat. Lance has got a lot going on and he might miss something come up on his uh, window there. So again, we'll make sure we've got time. We, I want to do Q and A along the way. Um, I know well enough at the end of this class, nobody's going to ask a question. You're going to want your two hours CE and get out of here. So I understand. So feel free to ask a few questions along the way on anything that might come up. Um, Jeff Topham, nice smile. You're like, yep, that's exactly what's going to happen. Um, so pretty straightforward. You're going to put a price in here. You're going to put an earnest money deposit. Um, most of the time, the construction deposit may not be established yet. Um, it might be tied to, you know, there are obviously individual options, selections, upgrades. Uh, maybe the builder wants to have them under contract to know they're real. They can get requalified. They can work on this simultaneously. So oftentimes construction deposit is going to be TBD. Um, and then of course their permanent loan amount. Uh, um, keep in mind, there's one thing that I've seen and a lot of builders that are traditional builders, um, have a standard formula we're going to notice in other documents that's either a flat fee or a percentage of upgrades or a base amount uh, plus a percentage. There's, there's no right or wrong in that. Um, but when you tip your hand and you say that the balance of purchase price of cash at, at settlement and you put in there, they're going to put down 200 grand on an $800,000 home. Um, I have seen quite a few custom builders tweak their deposit requirements to try to get as much of that cash as possible. No different than a normal Repsy, right? I mean, if, if a normal Repsy comes in and it's only a couple thousand dollars earnest money, but they're going to put a hundred grand down, we're going to always want to bump that earnest money amount to get a little more flesh out of the deal. So, uh, but keep that in mind with your buyers um, as you tip your hand there, that could affect construction deposit if it's with a more custom home builder. Um, you're going to add up the items in there. Um, again, uh, I made reference earlier, construction deposits sometimes can be staged. Um, it may not just be a one-time shot. They may require five or $10,000 while they work through the plans, especially if they're customizing them to your client. And then, um, and then they might have another, another phase of that as they get closer to. So there could be more than just one non-refundable deposit in this process. Hey, Lance, Jonathan Sexton's got a question about the landscape bond. Jonathan, I've unmuted you. You want to go ahead and ask that out loud? Oh, I just uh, noticed that the contract said seller pays. So where's the confusion? Thus, the confu words. Yeah, that's a good question, Jonathan. The confusion is that the buyer is responsible to put their own landscaping in. The seller's not going to want to pay a bond in favor of a buyer who has their own deadline. And if the buyer loses a job, doesn't have the money, uh, delays their time, and now they've missed their 12-month period or whatever the time frame is to put their their uh their landscaping in in theory that bond could be pulled it could be delivered back to somebody else um, they could lose that in some sort of a deposit um and so you have a situations where um most builders just they, they forget to talk about that landscape bond it really should be in the contract that if the buyer is providing their landscaping and there's a landscape performance bond that the buyer should be placing that performance bond so it's they're really posting it for their own performance, if that makes sense. So hopefully that clears. Um, let's go down to 2.2, construction deposit. Um, 
So again, very simple in here, uh, provided the buyer's not canceled the REPC based on their evaluations, um, it's gonna ask you whether they will or will not be providing a construction deposit. And um, pretty straightforward. I love this word right here, the earnest money deposit and construction deposit, if applicable. Okay, so let's talk about that. If you are working with a buyer and you are buying a one-off home with a builder, and they do not require a construction deposit, and the home is half under construction, or the home has the ability for your buyer to select personal options and upgrades specific to them, um, and the builder does not require a construction deposit, you need to make a note to go back to that builder at the end of the transaction after it goes well to talk to them about maybe offering some help in their future stuff that they're selling. Because they obviously are gonna need some guidance here. And again, surprisingly, I see this more often than not in the Valley with some of the one-off home builders. Um, I get calls from agents who there is no construction deposit and there are no items. And so um, it's a good reminder though that, I mean, every builder is gonna be charging a, a, a non-refundable deposit, especially if your buyer is putting their own personal upgrades in. So example, that would be like Steve Sen or Steve Jr. ordering a custom suit and the tailor not requiring a non-refundable deposit. Because the truth is, it ain't gonna fit anybody else. <laughs> it certainly ain't gonna fit me, and it's never gonna get sold off the rack. So it's, it's no different. When builders start building custom homes for people, they want security, they want deposit. So again, keep that in mind. Um, if you see builders that just don't operate maybe as strictly as they should, a little more old school, there's an opportunity there to go back and maybe try to help them shore up their business a little bit more. Um, you'll notice here, um, it says down here, and this is often overlooked too, it, it's big, but it says non-refundable construction deposit. Um, and it says non-refundable to buyer unless the seller fails to close the transaction. Okay, look, I don't know a scenario where the seller is going to fail to close a transaction. Now you might have a situation where you've got a large development, they've maybe got some time frames that are a few years out to complete, and there could be some problems, but most of the time, that substantial completion deadline we talked about um, is floating, it's moving all the time. It's got all sorts of provisions um, that are built into the REPC, but even the ones that are not built into the REPC, uh, the builder's not gonna be bound by them. They're gonna want something very, uh, they want to make sure that is can be completely massaged. I mean, they're not going to say it's based on acts of God. They're not going to say it's based on suppliers. They're going to say it is whatever it is. And when it's done, your buyer is going to close. So that goes back to that comment of, of saying, you know, how do we protect a buyer? I think the best thing we can do is help them understand they're going to have nominable money. They're going to have a date that most likely won't be met. And they need to prepare for that. Um, I'll jump ahead and just say, look, keep in mind, um, this becomes a problem when you have, well, we'll get to it. I, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves. So settlement, this, this next section of settlement and closing, um, I'm going to skip over this entire thing. It's pretty straightforward, like a typical transactions with settlement, closing, prorations, special assessments, fees, and what closing means. So nothing really there to go over in my opinion. Um, we'll move on to section four and section five. So section five, I've got, a, uh, I've got a poll for you, I'd like for you to answer. And it's got a little um, item here. So let's launch this. You are the listing agent for a builder and a buyer calls wanting you to write an offer for them. They confirm they are not working with an agent. What form do you have them sign? Holy smokes, some of you answered that question Halfway through. Lance, it looks like one of those old carnival horse races where they keep going, you know, next to each other. So can people see, can people see the percentages on the screen as people are selecting? Not until yeah. you share them. Gotcha. On my end, I can see every time someone picks one, I can see the horse race. The problem is if we showed that, then people would be biased in their decisions and they'd want to go with the crowd. <laughs> so we have to keep you guys honest about this.
One more second. We got a few more people still answering here. All right, we'll end this poll and we'll give you an answer here. Thirty-seven percent say buyer broker. Sixty-three percent say unrepresented buyer disclosure. Now, the truth is, there's no wrong answer. You can go with either one of these. Um, it really just depends on managing risk and what the buyer actually is looking for. So this is a big deal. Um, if a buyer calls you and they say, listen, you know, we don't have an agent. Uh, we would like for you to represent us in this transaction. You're going to have to make the decision whether you're comfortable in being a limited agent and representing both the buyer and the builder. However, you also will get phone calls where people say, look, we don't have an agent. Um, we, 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 you know, we're not really worried about it. We feel comfortable representing ourselves or anything close to that. And you might decide that the unrepresented buyer form um, works great as well. Keep in mind, there's risk associated with the buyer broker and the limited agency agreement. That risk, uh, I'll share an example with you. Years ago, um, I hate to go back to landscaping, but I think it'll apply for any any punch list items, you get to the end of a transaction and you have a buyer walk happening with this buyer. And there are items that are not completed. It could be landscaping, it could be some minor miscellaneous items. And again, the contract here that we're gonna go through allows for an escrow. And in that discussion, um, I, I got a phone call years ago. I can still remember it today. My wife and I were at the gateway, uh, for the grand opening of the gateway downtown. And as we were um, just entering the gateway, looking out over this great area, um, I got a phone call. And the phone call was from a previous buyer. And he said, Lance, I don't know if you remember, my wife and I, we bought a home from you with a builder out in, uh, it was out in Stansbury Park at the time. He says, and I wanted to let you know that, you know, it's been three years. Our landscaping is still not in. The builder was supposed to put it in. And... Um, you didn't represent us in this and we are intending to hire an attorney to file a lawsuit against you. Well, needless to say, um, our stay at the gateway was short lived. There was no way to enjoy the next couple of hours with that phone call. And we immediately packed it up and drove home. And as a matter of fact, I drove to Heber uh, to my parents' property and dug into the old boxes that we used to have to keep all these copies of in file format and found the transaction and opened it up and lo and behold, I had signed an unrepresented buyer disclosure with them, which was perfect because I never represented them. And I replied back to them saying, listen, I understand you might be frustrated. Um, unfortunately, I didn't represent you. Actually, I had told them that on the phone um, that I, I was positive that they had signed an unrepresented buyer form, but I needed to go find out for myself. Um, I have made a policy in 23 years of selling new homes that I never sign a buyer broker or a limited agency with a buyer that walks in. It's my team's policy. It is a firm policy. Uh, we do not bend on that. I do not want the risk. And it is incredibly difficult to get to the end of a closing and have a developer or builder, you have multiple homes still to sell and you have one buyer and how you're gonna toe that line of representing them. Don't make the decision on this based on commission. Because remember, commission's paid based on your listing agreement. It's not paid on whether you represent the buyer or not. So be careful in your decisions with this. Um, but I would, I would highly, highly recommend we use an unrepresented buyer form as much as we can. Um, in the field, though, here, um, a lot of times what will happen on, uh, in number five is the listing agent's name will show up in here. And if you're the listing agent, uh, that's great. But if you've got a team member, or somebody helping represent you at the project, sitting in a builder's model, um, put your team member's name in there too. It is certainly implied when they walk in the door that your team member represents the seller also. Uh, please just put both names in there, put, put the listing agent um, and put your uh, model agent or your team member's name that's helping work the transaction on behalf of the seller. Go ahead and put that in there. Any questions on that? You know, Lance, uh, Kevin Larson's got a comment uh, a little bit about that. Uh, Kevin, why don't we go ahead and unmute you? You can talk about what you chatted there. Yeah, it's just uh, indicating that uh, the division would prefer we don't intentionally create 
uh, limited agency. Um, if the buyer definitely wants representation, then we would obviously sign a buyer's agency and a limited agency agreement. But if the buyer doesn't want representation, we shouldn't um, push the issue and try to get them to accept our representation. We should just use the unrepresented buyer disclosure and uh, continue our representation with the seller. That limits our risk. You know, I, I just saw, um, I just saw Chrissy on the, on the call. So there's some stuff we're not going to be able to talk about today that was a little questionable. So we'll, uh, we'll continue on. Very good point, Kevin. I totally agree. Um, you know, uh, one, of, one of the agents here is asking, is that all situations or just new construction? All situations. Uh, all situations, certainly. Yeah. I mean, if you can limit if you can limit the risk and only representing your, I mean, your general client, um, absolutely take that road whenever possible. Um, it's a great habit, and it's something you should practice. There's a lot of agents that uh, that that just immediately jump into representing them, and and so be cautious of that. Practice what that what that flow is going to be like. Here's another example too. We get buyers that walk into models and say, hey, I don't have an agent. Um, can I get 3% off? And that's a great question, right? I think I've got everybody's attention now. Um, a lot of times our reply is saying, listen, unfortunately, if you don't have an agent, we don't provide a discount of commission towards that. Um, that's basically between us and the builder. Um, however, are you, are you looking for representation? Because if you are, I want to encourage you that we make a phone call right now and let's call the agent that you're wanting to represent you in the deal. Almost every time, probably 95% of the time, they immediately go, well, no, we really don't want an agent. We just want something because we don't have an agent. And it's a lot of times our builders have said, hey, look, when that happens, just see, we'll offer them like, well, a lot of times our builder will offer you a fridge. And the builders are fine to offer a fridge or something nominal. And I would tell you again, 95% of the time, the buyers jump on it. They're just looking for something. Um, they really are not looking for an agent. They might not even know a good agent and they don't know that their agent's going to help them in this transaction. So there's some ways to work around that. Um, so just keep that in mind as you, as you go about it. Let's continue on item. We're going to move down here into item six title. Title. Yep. Sorry, while you're making that transition, we have a little bit of a housekeeping item here. Um, some of you don't have your full names displayed, and it's very hard for us to take attendance because we just have initials or something like that. If you click on the button on the bottom that says participants, then find your name on that right hand side and then hover over your name. You'll see a little uh, name that's a little blue button that says more. If you, you can click more, go down to rename and then put in your full name. If you can see your full name on the screen when you're looking at the grid, you're fine. But if you've only got initials or if we don't have your full name, we just need you to, to do that so we can make sure that we get an accurate attendance count. Sorry, Lance, back to you. All good. Yeah. Um, let's talk and about what? title. Title on here. A um, couple of things to point out. Uh, typical, the state, again, the state approved REPC shows on here. 6.1, um, that the seller is going to provide you a general warranty deed. A lot of builders will change that in a builder doc and only provide a special warranty deed. They only want to provide, um, they only want to warrant the property for the time they've owned it, not back to the beginning of time, if you will. And so uh, they, might, they might override that and have a special warranty deed instead of an offering for a general. I wouldn't worry about that. I don't know that the title property and the deed being provided really has, it's not a big deal. What's a big deal is in 6.2 and the title insurance they're gonna offer you. There's an Alta homeowner's policy that's standard in the state approved REPSI saying that the seller is going to provide this Alta policy. Does any, in, in your chats, in your chat area, does anybody know, throw in there why the Alta is important with new construction? Does anybody know? This is a big deal. So I'm, I'm glad we're covering this topic. Um, and I don't know we've got any takers. Okay, there we go. Debbie Sexton says covers construction liens. You're absolutely right. Thanks for going on a limb there. 
Um, and Fran, same thing. Oh, now everybody's on board, I see. Um, hey, look, you, an Alta policy gives you 180 days of coverage for liens after the closing date. And that's an important deal. And so since the Alta coverage will, the Alta homeowner's policy will cover back to the beginning of time and will cover you through 180 days past, that's why the deed's not as big a deal um, on a special warranty deed. But I need you to be careful. There are some builders who remove any sort of homeowner's policy from their offering as a seller completely. Uh, I, I hate to use builders' names um, in our recorded session, but uh, to my knowledge, Lennar, one of the largest home builders in the U.S., who is here after acquiring uh, Candlelight Homes, um, does not offer any homeowner's policy to the buyer at closing. Zero. Zilch. So if your buyer wants it, they're going to have to buy it. It's going to be an expense that they pay at closing. Now, I've heard that they do tie it into one of their preferred title options that if you close with their title company, they kind of uh, promote and induce you to try to use their title company to remove the split. And then they'll provide a basic coverage. But that's a big deal. So highlight that, star it, make sure you know. Again, the state approved REPSI, if it's not, if it's not taken out in a builder's stock, 6.3 will give them some protection. You'll notice here it's got some protection against uh, those liens. But again, it's only to a max of $5,000, which isn't enough. So be careful on those policies as, uh, as you are working with your clients. Um, and again, it only applies in, in, the, in this REPSI to owner-occupied residences. So that protection for civil action or the, against liens is, is not available if it's an investment property. So again, don't worry about the deed. Don't worry about the, the coverage here. Just get them an Alta policy, have them put it in their budget, make sure they're covered, um, and that'll give them that peace of mind from future liens as well. Um, question saying, yeah, just add it in in an addendum, right? That the seller is gonna provide that. I would ask the seller if they will, first and foremost. If they kick it back saying that they won't, um, then uh, it certainly it doesn't have to necessarily be in the contract. It's just gonna be a buyer at an expense with the title company. Lance, if we have a little break here, back a little while ago, Annie Mead had a question about listing new construction. Um, she's just curious, making sure that she's doing um, that correctly. Uh, Annie, I go ahead and unmute you there. Can you want to ask that question out loud? Uh, yes. Good morning. Good morning. I had to put my hat on because you wanted our picture. You no <laughs> problem. You look great, Annie. <laughs> So anyway, um, yeah, I had a, a, some new construction homes I listed last year, three of them, and one of them I had a buyer walk in and uh, decided to make an offer, and they wanted to do their own updates, which the builder had agreed. Um, he had some uh, different reps he was using for carpet and so forth, and so we agreed and my buyers agreed they wanted to work through these um reps and so i did a limited um because i just thought it would be easier to represent them with questions um, because i knew the reps because of my seller so um you know at times i wished i would have done the other the um unrepresented because it got to be kind of a hassle but I didn't know, you know, after listening to this, I'm thinking, well, maybe next time it would be better to go the other route, but I wasn't sure. So that's my question. Yeah, good question, Annie. I, 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 don't, see, I, I don't see any issue with you representing a seller and guiding a buyer, not representing the buyer, but guiding the buyer through the selections and options. It's pretty normal, right? I mean, if you go to a DR Horton Ivory Homes, they're going to have their sales environments and their, their model, um, excuse me, their, their option centers and things. Um, and the buyers are going to go through their work with other people and you're going to be there with them. Um, I, there's no concern at all. It's mostly transactional based is where that liability is going to run into. So yeah, good question though. Um, let's continue on. So that'll take us down to sellers disclosures. Um, in here we've got, um, let me see. Item A is pretty traditional, right? This is a pretty standard list of disclosures, seller property condition disclosure form for the land and any improvements. Is there a land seller disclosure? So you can use the land one. A lot of agents will use um, a standard one and then just they'll, they'll X out different things. I wanna show you 
right here. And here's a, here's a printout I pulled off the MLS a couple of days ago. Um, we'll shrink this down a little bit. And go right there. Homes under construction, it's obviously under construction. Um, it's been on the market for only six days. You can see the photo, but look down here at the very end. It says, not in the remarks, but in the agent remarks. It says, note, there will be no property disclosure as it is a new home and no one has ever lived in it. Okay, we know the roof hasn't leaked and we know the plumbing and mechanical are gonna be in working order, but there are some items on the disclosure that outline soils and environmental concerns and those things. Now, some agents are gonna say, well, look, if I go back to this lands item, E right here says that the seller is responsible to provide written notice of any claims or conditions known to the seller relating to environmental soil stability drainage. It's pretty rare, if ever, that I see a seller disclose in a new development that there's a problem with environmental or soil or drainage issues. So it's only going to say, hey, you know, we're not aware of anything. Um, and, and then you have agents who are saying, we're not even going to provide one. Don't let them get away without providing a disclosure. They need to at least provide stuff on soils, environmental, and all the items that are on the land disclosure or on the standard disclosure if they want to cross things out, if that's, if that's, if that's how they had their, their client do it. Make them provide you something. And, um, and in, the builder, and in one of our builder forms, I'm going to show you an example of uh, why that's important. Um, again, pretty standard here. Title report, copies of CCNRs, rules affecting the property, recorded plat, um, most recent minutes, budgets, financial statements. If it's a new subdivision, you may not see a lot in that department. Um, evidence of water shares, if there was one. You know, plans and specs for the residents, again, or reduced copies thereof. Almost every time you're going to get a small reduced copy. It's never going to be a full blueprint. Um, and the name of the contractor and contractor's license number. That wasn't required years ago, but is now. Um, and then of course, they're gonna have some other disclosures relating to uh, R values and thicknesses of insulation and those things on the energy efficient. And then builder warranty, if different than section 11. Let's skip to section 11 real fast. And let's just see what number 11 says. It says seller warrants, uh, unless the seller's providing an alternate builder's warranty, uh, they do warrant heating, cooling, electrical, plumbing, landscapers, sprinklers, and a lot of different things for a period of one year. I would tell you that there's a lot of builders that just use this simple clause. If you have two things to be, to, to be aware of here, though, on this particular piece of a REPSI. If you have a home that was just completed and uh, the certificate of occup occupancy was just issued, and now you need to use a standard existing home, standard REPSI. And you represent a buyer, cut and paste this section into your addendum for your new contract. Otherwise, you're gonna miss talking about the warranty because um, the builder doesn't provide a disclosure of a warranty on a standard REPSI, do they? So don't miss this part. This, this, this little clause now is not available to you when you're using this, when you're using the standard REPSI. So just cut and paste this and put that in there. However, one thing to note, it says that the seller is gonna warrant this, but there's a lot of times that the builder and the seller are two separate people. You may have an ownership group that are a couple of guys that own a project, and they have hired a builder to build homes for them on a fee basis. When I know that's the case, um, I oftentimes will just have the builder initial off on this as well. I'll just throw a little signature line in the addendum and say, hey, if you just wouldn't mind having the builder initial this as well. Um, it just, it, it should, again, it's something extra for your client in the file that if there's ever a problem. Um, what you don't want is a seller, who, and we've had this before, You've got a seller who's got an obligation to provide a warranty and the seller is on a, you know, an LLC with another partner. And the minute the project's done and the last tax return is done, they have basically terminated their LLC and have hit the road. And you've got a builder who built it, but doesn't have that same obligation to you. Most builders are still going to do those items and it was included in their contract. But I think just to kind of dot the I's and cross the T's, it's a great feature to have included so be aware of that going Lance, back uh, yep 
Quick question. Um, a lot of the builders warrant or uh, contracts other than the state approved uh, Repsi um, don't have that builder's warranty in there. And they, you know, I think intentionally exclude it from there. So we should be looking out for that in any of those uh, new, or the, the, the developer um, Repsis, right? Absolutely. Yeah, but something to keep in mind so that you can add it in or be specific in their builder document about what that warranty really is. Because it's um, not state law and are required that they provide a one year. It's by contract, right? That is correct. I mean, okay. um, going back to this, uh, remember this one that said that they were not going to provide a disclosure because it's a new home. How about this last sentence? Seller will pay up to $400 for a one year warranty. So that's the same thing you're saying, Kevin. There's, there's, there's some little catches in here that you just got to pay attention to. And again, the hope is that through this discussion, you'll be able to pick up on a few of these items that'll help you out. You know, Jeff Topham mentions here, a lot of builders apply their manufacturer's warranty. Absolutely, they do. Um, all, their, all their contractor agreements require that the contractor warrant those items. But there's definitely going to be items that are more builder uh, warranted than a manufacturer. So keep, just keep that in mind. Lance, if a builder is not offering a one-year warranty um, to cover the construction defects and all those types of things, uh, how much does it cost if you're asking for it or if they refuse, how much would it be for a buyer to get that protection? You know, I really don't know. I don't, I don't know the number on that. I haven't looked at it in years. Um, we have a lot of builders that are now providing it because it's kind of become very norm. Um, I was surprised to see this on this listing, um, but I don't have an answer for you. Um, we can try to find one though. I mean, we can, I can look out and try to and send a, an email out after the class in the next day or two that would have a couple of options should you encounter that. Um, you've right. also got options to add on like 210 warranties for structural and mechanical and some of those things um, that could add extended warranties. Some builders offer that as part of their normal package. Um, so again, just pay attention. Um, yeah, again, we're on saying, Hey, a home warranty would not cover a roof. Exactly. There's a lot of manuf non manufactured items in a home, uh, that would not fall under the manufactured warranty. So, um, section eight, section eight, um, I'll, I'll try to hit a few items in here. It's pretty straightforward. Your buyer's going to have some due diligence period. Um, they're going to have the ability to review here, any other tests, evaluations and verifications outside of the buyer due diligence. Uh, items or the seller's disclosure items that were provided them to review. Um, it, it says here they'll also have the chance to review environmental issues or geological conditions. Well, the question is that if the seller is not going to provide it and they only have to provide you written claims, where are you going to find this? Where are you going to find any information on environmental or geological soils or items like that? Any, any thoughts? You're going to go to the city. Every development um, is going to have a number of checklist items and the city is going to require from that builder to know the soils. Um, they're going to want to know that the city engineer is going to review the soils and review the architects, you know, footings and foundations to make sure they meet the soils conditions. So if you're looking to try to get some information on that, get that from the city. I'll show you an example of where that's at in, in one of our sample documents, but um, it's a good thing to be aware of. Lance, uh, Grace has a comment too about some of the warranties. Grace, I've unmuted you. You want to just say, share your comment there? Yes. What happened to the construction 10 year homeowner's warranty that used to be given on every sale of a new, new property, a new house? Um, good question. Builders cut it out of their line item because it costs 750 bucks. And, uh, and in order to be more profitable, they removed an extended warranty and they only typically offer the one year. So uh, they have been gone for many, many years. Um, I believe DR Horton actually still offers a 210 or they did a few years back. Um, so you might get more of a national home builder that feels like that's part of their, it's a good way to cover them across multiple states um, and having the same policy, but the 10 year or the 210 has been gone for a long time, but, but can be purchased for an additional cost. So back to our, um, uh, you know, items, you know, buyer's going to have a chance to, to review and follow, you know, evaluate this completely. They're going to have the right to object um, or resolve those items. Um, if, if they do decide to cancel, 
um, you know, their deposits would be returned to them. Again, so long as it's before the due diligence deadline, which is why I like that drop dead date that we talked about in section 24 um, in the beginning. Um, we'll slide down here to financing. Um, it's got an item here of whether the, uh, the obligations of who's gonna be responsible for obtaining the construction loan. We are seeing, I mean, most often a traditional subdivision, as you know, uh, builders are gonna provide that construction financing. That's why they want that construction deposit. Uh, there was a question earlier, someone asked of why is the construction deposit so, so important? And it's again, because they're building that custom suit for Steve Jr. They're building that custom home uh, for your client or for, the, or for a buyer that, you know, in a subdivision representing. Um, we are seeing more often though, builders historically have not had buyers sign on construction loans in traditional subdivisions. The reason is that it made, it, it made the, uh, the construction budget transparent. So all of a sudden now the buyer can see the builder's profit, the, your commissions, and all the different light items to, uh, to their contractors. That is starting to get a little more protected. There are a couple of lenders out there who are um, as part of, you know, a builder might have a buyer add their name to the construction loan to sign on it with the builder. Um, and they do not see the breakdown. They just have a guaranteed price. Um, and that may actually help reduce their construction deposit. Again, the buyer, the seller is just trying to protect, you know, their, uh, their, their investment, if you will. And, um, you know, when you start thinking about building a home, you know, you know, we'll use a home in Salt Lake. If you've got a home you're building for a client and it's 700,000, you know, you could have a deposit of maybe 40 or 50,000 bucks. Well, when items like COVID happen or market crashes or things like that happen and they freak out buyers, buyers are probably okay to walk from 50 grand. And sometimes builders have a hard time knowing how they're still gonna sell that home uh, for 650 versus 700 or 700 versus 750. They still feel like they're out on a limb. So keep a note of that. We're seeing more and more builders have, your, have the buyer client sign on the construction loan. They'll reduce the construction deposit, but they know they're committed and in the, on the hook for this. So um, just keep, a note, keep an eye on it. Um, trying to think here if there's anything else down here. I'm not, I'm not worried about the cash deal. It gives an out for a seller. Um, if they don't, uh, if they don't love the, the proof of funds, if they're concerned with the buyer's true cash ability, um, it gives them a, an ultimate out that they don't approve the proof of funds. Um, application for loan. Let's talk about preferred lenders for a minute. Who likes preferred lenders with uh, our home builders? Ooh, I see some thumbs down. I see some, uh, I see, uh, it's probably mixed. I should have had a, uh, let's make sure I don't have a poll for that. I should have had a poll for this one. That would have been a good one. Um, nope, don't see it on there. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's just one of those beasts that's in our industry. Uh, th there's a reason for the preferred lender. And I think most of it is a fact that they just don't want, but I want, let me, let me make sure I point this out. Cause there's a, there's a part in here that is really interesting. Your, per, your preferred lender name is going to go in here and it says that they shall obtain a pre-qualification -quali letter from the preferred lender. Now, if you're representing the buyer, you might say, nope, we're not putting their name in here. Look down here on their right to cancel. Um, let me see where I've got it. It's 8.3B right here. Why am I missing it? Right here. Buyer shall apply for any applicable loan from the preferred lender. And if applicable, the alternate lender in order to obtain a prequal letter. So we're seeing that often that even if you represent a buyer and you have your own lender, and they do not, and you're, 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 you've convinced them or your buyer is convinced they do not want to use a preferred lender. They are still going to have to most likely pull an application from the preferred builder anyway. The reason for that is simple. The builder wants to know that um, the buyer's brother-in-law isn't just giving you some fake prequal saying that he's good to go. Um, and then they get close to closing and realize that, oh shoot, we have got a credit issue that we've been meaning to get fixed and we thought it would be done by now. Um, that is the last thing the builder wants. And so it is very common that if you're not using the preferred lender to that you're gonna have to still uh, pull an application with them. Um, I would say get, just get, kind of get more used to that process. Again, educating your buyer in advance will help them to know some of these obstacles that might be out in front of them. Um, preferred lenders, I mean, let's, let's be honest, if it's a $3,000, $4,000, $5,000 uh, lender incentive, 
Um, half of that is most likely uh, built into the price. And the other portion of that is being credited from the lender. So um, I know there's a lot of people that don't like preferred uh, lenders. Um, it, it does, it is, it is nice though. I mean, keep in mind, we're going to, we're going to see in a future, uh, one of these addendums that um, if you do not, if your buyer doesn't close on time and it had a seven day window to close after substantial completion, and it's been pushed and pushed and pushed. And all of a sudden now it happens and they've only got a seven day window to close this. There might be an extension behind that. Um, there might be some time frame behind that. Um, that they might have to pay some per diems to keep that in place. So um, having a preferred lender helps because the builder and the lender have a relationship. They can work on um, a lot of different items, including if a rate has, um, you know, if a lock on a rate has expired, um, it's nice to have the preferred lender in the saddle for that. His main goal, his, his or her main goal as a preferred lender is to make sure that that transaction goes well um, and they want to keep the builder happy. So they've got a lot more to lose typically than the one uh, loan deal that might be going to your preferred. So keep that in mind. Um, there's a question on here regarding subject to sale, Ali. I will cover that in just a minute. You see the one um, above, Lance, uh, about yeah. can you require the contractor uh, in order to include copies of the engineer reports as part of due diligence? Yeah, you can. Yep. Yeah, you, you, I mean, they, they've obviously got copies. They've provided them to the city. You can put it in as an added disclosure under other, have them provide anything like that. That's no problem. Um, make sure I didn't miss anything else here. I think we're good. Let me look at one thing. I think we're just gonna go down to uh, number nine. There's not a, let me look here, seller's remedy. Um, keep in mind, 8.4, I did miss over this, 8.4. If your buyer does not get that long-term loan, um, a lot of a lot of builders will allow a kind of a per diem to pay for some interest carry. Um, but again, the state approved form allows basically says if the seller agrees to accept as seller's exclusive remedy, the earnest money and construction deposit. So the most at loss is the construction deposit. Again, if your buyer is signed on the loan as part of the deal, um, it's not going to be quite so easy. They're going to be stuck on making sure that thing gets all the way and they'll be, they'll, they will be responsible. 9-1 plans and specs. Not a lot to cover here. Um, pretty traditional, you know, you're going to pick items. It talks about substantial completion, uh, having the ability to be pushed. I'm not really worried about that. Um, Pre-construction meeting, a lot of times people will default, um, you know, 10 days. Uh, up, this is 10 days that they're going to need um, buyer selections. There's a clause in here that allows the seller to pick in behalf of the buyer if the buyer stalls. It's pretty rare I ever see that exercised. It's in there only because if the builder had an actual substantial completion date in the contract, it needs, it needs a way to prohibit the buyer from stalling it and then the seller being susceptible to default at the end. Again, that's pretty much been mitigated by builders not putting a date in there, so no concern. And I think knowing a few of the clauses in here that maybe stand out as being glaring if your buyer says, this says that the seller can choose my paint color if I don't, um, it, it does say that, but I think helping them understand that that, uh, that would you know probably won't apply, but just based on a variable um, uh, substantial completion deadline. And again, the change orders are the same as well. Um, that they can change substantial completion as well. Again, there's no there's no uh, there's no fee amount in here, right? And a lot of builders have change order fees and process for change orders. They'll outline those in a builder addendum. So keep an eye on that. Additional terms. So what additional terms, throw it in your chat section, what additional terms would you see typically attached to a contract um, on a new construction rep seat? We'll give you just, a, just 15, 20 seconds here to throw a few items in there. What might be something you would see in here? Brandy Strong, I'm looking for an answer from you. Throw something in that chat section. Okay, Allie had, and Allie had the one before, subject to sale. Subject to sale should, could show up in there. What are the odds that a builder is going to build a home from scratch with a subject to sale? Probably pretty small. I have seen it. 
Uh, surprisingly, a lot of times a builder might say, well, look, I mean, my, my lender's not going to look at this as a pre-sold, but they, they are willing to extend me an extra spec that they might classify in this. And so maybe they use it to start something. Um, in that situation, there's always a need for um, some sort of requirement that the buyer's not gonna have the ability to go pick pink tile and blue walls. Um, something that's gonna hold them back that would be, that would be you know, in line with a normal selection. So, but I do see it from time to time. Um, okay, what additional documents? How about options, upgrades, and selections? A lot of times your buyer's gonna to wanna to attach a multi-page list. That maybe they wanna attach, the, attach the standard features or the included features list. They want something that says in this purchase agreement they're getting granite or they're getting quartz or they're getting whatever. Um, so I think that uh, what happens is, I, my recommendation to you is try not to put your options and selections as an attached document. Include it with your file as an exhibit A and write exhibit A across the top. I know that Edge Homes does it as an exhibit, but try not to include it as an actual item that is part of say the rep. The reason appraisers wanna see it if you include it and then they wanna scrutinize it and you have situations where maybe they only wanna give a value of a couple thousand bucks for a fridge and not 10 or 15,000 for a sub-zero. I just don't like appraisers getting into the middle of scrutinizing line items in a construction and trying to say that some of these items shouldn't apply to the price. So attach it as part of the deal. Don't include it as part of your options, but just put exhibit A. It's off to the side. Everybody knows. Everybody's most likely signed it as well, um, but I would keep it out of there. Um, what else might show in here? One, there's one other big one, especially if it's a first time home buyer, entry level housing. Um, something to deal with financing. Crickets. FHA addendum. FHA VA addendum shows up quite a bit in new construction deals. Um, and I have a poll for you. So let's throw this poll out here. Um, and here you go. You represent a young couple that cannot, that cannot find an existing home they like, so they decide they wanna build a new entry level home. They only qualify for an FHA loan. Could there be a concern with this transaction? Throw your, uh, throw your answers in there. Only about half of you replied. So I'm gonna let you take an extra minute on this as you think through it. All right, sorry for a little downtime there. I'm gonna end this poll in just a second. We've got 90% of you that have replied. And we'll hit end and let me share these with you. Here's the results from that. Can you guys see that? Okay, it's on a different screen, so just making sure. So large portion, yes, builder has concern. Yes, both buyer and builder have concern. And two of you think it's a dessert. So um, it must be getting close to lunchtime. Um, I would agree, it, th there is a concern for both builder and buyer. The, the builder's concern is obvious, right? The FHA addendum, um, I'm not, I mean, I can put it up on the screen here. I think I have it right here. The FHA addendum right here has an item two uh, you know, buyer shall not be obligated to complete the purchase of the property or incur any penalty or forfeiture of earnest money, deposit, or other down payment. Um, so the last thing that a builder wants to have happen is a home get built. They get all the way to closing 
it misses the appraisal by 10 bucks, 100 bucks, whatever. And uh, the buyer having an exclusive out and receiving all of their deposited funds of earnest money, construction money return. Um, what's the buyer's concern if it's for both, builder and buyer? The buyer's concern is that you're not gonna find a builder that'll do one. Um, that's, it's, and it's a big one, right? I mean, you're gonna probably struggle with that. Um, you might find one if you've got a spec and maybe it's 80, 90% done um, and they you know, really wanna sell it, they don't have anybody looking at it. Um, they might be able to sneak one of those in there, but for the most part, um, I can tell you from our perspective, uh, most of my builders just won't do one. Again, they'll just discriminate against it. You can discriminate against a loan product and uh, they have no intention of allowing the scenario to happen um, and putting them at risk of owning a home at the end. So kind of a big deal. So again, you're gonna see that, especially in the Wasatch front, in your entry level, you're gonna have buyers that want FHA, um, VA, you're gonna have, uh, you know, there's, it's, it's out there. And, and I would say it probably comes in on, you know, 15, 20% of our, especially maybe even more on the lower end housing. So um, just be aware that's out there and something to be, to just know, to know how to do. The rest of this document, typically we just put zeros in here. Sellers saying, hey, I'm not making any seller related repairs. I'm not, you know, I'm not paying for termite type stuff. If you, if you want this loan product, it's yours. Um, but typically we just fill zeros in there and no contribution for closing costs. Or if we are providing closing costs, that's fine, but obviously it'll get built into the purchase price. Builders aren't gonna come off their price typically to, to accommodate that. So that's it on that side. Going back to um, our REPC, we, cut, we covered warranties in 11. Section 12 is walkthrough. Um, pretty straightforward. Um, there's one clause in here that I just, and, and something that always seems to rear its head. Um, it, it'll, this, this allows for an, a walkthrough prior to closing. And then it also allows for the potential for an escrow to be held um, at settlement and a reasonable amount agreed uh, to by the seller and the lenders, assuming the lender will allow it. We're seeing less of that. And as we know, we are seeing some seasonal related escrows with winter related items that maybe can't be done or facilitated, maybe some painting or some fencing um, in the middle of winter. But Keep in mind, this, this seems like a pretty straightforward scenario. But I would tell you that most builders will not allow an escrow at closing. They just won't do it. And even though the contract says they can, uh, the way they get around it is they will just, so buyer walks in, does their inspection, they come up with a list of 20 items. Um, they want to escrow, say, $5,000. And what does the builder say? The builder says, nope. We'll just push the substantial completion. We don't have a certificate of occupancy yet. And so we're gonna push it out for 30 days and we'll complete the work. The reason, they don't wanna be held hostage. They don't wanna get into this deal and have the buyer complaining that there's more things on the list that should have been on the list or that stuff wasn't done to the, the way they want it to be done. And now the builder can't get that five grand back. The buyer's gonna argue, well, hey, I've got a lock expiring in the next week. And the builder oftentimes will say, well, then you just need to make a choice. Either we close the deal and you trust that I'm gonna get the work done, or you, and you keep your lock, or you lose your lock and you pay the extension fee and we'll close in three weeks. So be aware of that. Um, we're, we're in that critical time in a transaction where a lot of things can go wrong. And um, this is probably the, the danger in new construction. The danger in new construction is if this build job takes six, eight, 10, 12 months, you need to have on your radar 45 days out before that projected day the property will be done. It has to be high on your radar to really understand how close that date is gonna get hit. You have all sorts of things that are gonna be, that your, that your buyers are arranging, right? They've got locks, they've got moving, they're giving notice to rents if they're, if they're living in a rental, um, they're, they've scheduled moving trucks and friends and all of a sudden they, you know, everything seems to be on track. And then two weeks before closing, the builder says, oh shoot, I'm off a week. I got to push this. That is a problem. Your buyer does not want to move in with mom and dad temporarily. They don't want to have to extend their rent if they can't. Keep in mind that there's still a lot of apartment projects that have 95 plus percent occupancy. Um, 
it, it's still challenging. It can really derail the relationship with your buyer to end on a really poor note and you have no control over it. So communicate, communicate with the superintendent or your sales agent, um, but make sure that you know you can hit that number um, at that date um, and keep that uh, relationship good. Um, substantial completion. So what is substantial completion? Well, it's buried in 12.2. Everything ties to this contract in it, and it, we, we bury it in 12.2, basically says that the residence will be considered substantially complete when it's allowed to be occupied under uh, local rules, laws, civil jurisdiction. Um, it's funny, it says, you know, in there somewhere, you know, if in the absence of governmental regulations, um, and then it gives a definition. I don't know where that exists, but if you can build a home where there's no government regulation, that's, that's pretty neat. So, um, but keep in mind that that's substantial completion, right? Um, construction access can become a big deal in 12.3, right down here. Seller reserves the right to limit buyer's inspections of the property. Have any of you ever had a difficult client that has been basically banned from the project? Banned to see their home under construction? Patrick's smiling because he's got enough new construction. He knows uh, what those clients look like. But it's an interesting thing. Help educate. I mean, I'm doing a deal with uh, an agent in our Salt Lake office right now. They signed the contract about 45 days ago. Um, the, it, the permit has not been issued by Draper City. And the buyer is already upset and wants to just call out the builder. I, I just wouldn't recommend it. There's no sense in getting off on a bad foot. Educate your buyer that this is going to be a long process. Again, educate them that we may not hit these dates. If they are trying to plan this completion of our home um, to be in line with a baby to be born, make sure they have alternate plans. Um, there is nothing worse than that home coming in 30 days late and everything being derailed. So, there is no closing gift that you can offer your buyer that is going to make up for the last 30 days of experience. So really try to be out in front and spend some time with them on helping them be prepared uh, for that date. Um, everything else is pretty standard in here. I, I don't know that we need to cover anything else in here. Unavoidable delays, I'm not worried about that. It, it talks about how things could delay things and substantial completion again. Builder's not going to be susceptible to this. They're going to push it anyway. And um, everything else for the rest of this document is pretty boilerplate. So any questions on the rep C? Um, let, me let me switch back to our chat. Um, let's see, sweat equity. You know, I'm sure there are some options out there, but I have not seen any lately. Um, it's a good question. I and mean, we used to allow some of that. We, don't, we just don't see it as much anymore. Um, anyway, let's, I, I wanna move on to, to one other item. You've got two other documents that were provided in the email. Both of them are builder documents. Um, there's a large format one, which, it, which looks like this, and which is 11 pages. And then there's a smaller one that is just a three page. We're gonna go with mostly the three page one. And, I, and you'll notice both of these provided say example on them. They say example because um, we, we don't want you to feel like we as a brokerage are providing these to you. These are just samples that other builders have used. Um, these are very similar. One's a small version and a large version from, uh, I believe, the same builder. Um, but they're just examples for our discussion. Um, we do provide these examples to our builder clients, but we require them to hire an attorney, draft their own language, and provide it back to us for review and for Chrissy to review um, so that we can sign off on the use of it in a development project. So please do not get into a habit of trying to draft this language or cut and paste from these documents to make it work. Um, but a and couple of things, real quick. This, oh, go ahead. Uh, so Rick Burton asked a question a little bit earlier about using a separate commission agreement with the builder when representing the buyer. So for example, he said Edge Homes said that they have a blanket commission agreement with BHHS, but how do we handle that for a smaller builder? Well, yeah, I mean, you can do an escrow instruction. I mean, I know that um, a few of our managers on here might cringe at me saying that, but I, it works in that fashion to just make sure that you're protected. Um, they might have their own commission agreement though. It might just be a simple one pager. Again, 
like most developments, if you have a development and you have 80 units in that development, there's probably only four or five or six that are on the MLS. So you might go in thinking you're going to buy, you know, you're going in off the remarks of unit 102, but your client might buy unit 207 and it's not on the MLS. Just fill, make sure you've got something protected in there um, that shows that they are willing to pay. If they, if they have their own agreement, that's great. Um, some builders will only pay on base price. Some builders will pay on base price plus upgrades. Uh, some, I mean, it, it's, it, it's, a, it's a hybrid. So some will only pay on net, not paying on any increase in prices for closing costs. Some will pay on the gross of the whole thing. So again, be aware of that. Um, but you can always just add an agreement in there that, uh, that outlines an escrow instruction could work for that. It's not perfect, um, but uh, it, it could work to just make sure that you're protected. Hitting some of these highlights on this short form, um, just a couple of things. We've got a, uh, you know, this outlines here, the non-refundable construction deposit. This is shown as a $4,000 amount plus a 20% of upgrades, not to exceed 10 grand. You're gonna see all sorts of hybrids of this. There's no right or wrong. It's only what the builder will allow. Um, I have seen builders be a little flexible on some payment plans from time to time. Maybe they've got a home they've got a so that, that they have to sell. It's not contingent upon them to buy, to sell the home, to acquire the property, um, but they would love to get it closed, free up some cash, and then provide, provide additional. Um, most builders don't like that. It's a little bit more intensive on the admin side, um, but you might, you, you might be able to negotiate that if you represent a buyer that's just not flush with cash and wants to try to just you know, stage their way through this. That is an option that, that, that would work. Um, and then going down through here, closing. Uh, this says here, seller recommends that buyer close the transaction. Almost every builder document has some sort of recommendation. It's not a requirement. Again, I don't believe state law will allow you to force that. Um, but we do have builders, like I said earlier, Lennar, that will, will entice so much on some homeowner's policies and maybe keys at closing, um, some extra items if you're using their title company, if you're avoiding the split. So I would just recommend embrace it when you can. Um, and then, uh, you know, again, that last 30 days is important. So if, you, if you're using preferred lender, if you're using their preferred title, um, it can help streamline that experience and, and not have a concern. Um, Obviously, preferred lender, that's, that's a spot for the incentive. Some builders have their own incentive page. They may just attach it as an exhibit if you're using their preferred uh, lender, um, or there might just be an amount in here specific to it. Keep in mind that not all builders will provide a preferred lender incentive if your client pays cash. So the, the lender is creating some of that money off of fee and origination fee, and they're providing a small incentive of that back. But if your client's paying cash, um, you might want to see if there's any way you can get some of that builder incentive, the preferred lender incentive accordingly. So um, you might outline on here homeowner association fees, and then there's your comment. Number seven, sellers shall make a reasonable effort to have the residence fully constructed on or before and a date. And then notwithstanding, buyer understands and agrees, delays may arise, and then we know when the closing is, it's typically seven days later. Um, there's a question here online saying, why don't some people like to use preferred lenders? You know, I mean, that, that would be a great discussion amongst a group if we could open up the chat, but we'd hear everybody's dogs barking and lawnmowers running. So um, I'll try to answer that. It's really just relationships. Um, people don't like to release their finances to somebody they don't know. Um, they don't know if they want the builder to see the details of their nitty gritty. Um, the agents want them to use their lenders because they just prefer that relationship. I would say it's mostly relationship driven. Um, but, you know, certainly feel free to have your own personal uh, mortgage relationship, you know, compare product and pricing, see if there's something that might make sense for your buyers to go through. But I would encourage you to at least embrace the idea of them getting, um, uh, you know, get a comparable bid. I mean, again, they're gonna have to fill out a loan application most likely anyway, anyway with the preferred lender to make sure that they're qualified. Um, and you're right, Patrick, there could be some hidden fees and points or a yield spread um, in the rate. So certainly getting a couple of comparisons is, is, a, great, is a great thing to consider. Um, going down through here, just a couple of final things in here. This one, here's an example where if you've got a substantial completion date with a time frame of seven days after, well, how long do they have to build it? Well, this agreement, allowed 
for two years from the date upon executing the contract. So there was a drop dead date in this, but it's two years. That two years does not surprise me. Um, it's not uncommon for a home that's 900,000 in the Valley, or in, the, in the Wasatch Front right now, to take close to 12 months to build anyway. Um, so, and with delays, with some COVID, with um, you know, maybe certain some delays at the cities issuing permits. I know inspections have become more difficult. Um, it doesn't surprise me that you've got a date that's kicked out that far. Uh, but again, be aware so that uh, your buyers aren't surprised by this. Change order fees down here. This one outlines 250 bucks. You'll see on the larger format um, document that it's 500 bucks. Um, again, I'm trying to just make you aware of a lot of different things. I'm hoping it's not too much information, but you might have some built that require a fee just to get a custom price. Some buyers have seen all sorts of fancy stuff in Park City Magazine and Utah Style and Design, and they want to do something kind of unique, and it requires a full custom bid for that style of fireplace or metal surround or, or, or glass panels on a, on a deck. I mean, there's a lot of different things that could come up. Some builders will charge a $200, $300 fee just to get the custom price and it's completely non-refundable. It's not part of a down payment program. It's not part of a construction deposit. It is an admin fee on the side. If you choose to go with that feature, they'll credit that in. But keep in mind, some builders do have that and there's a reason for it. Um, let's see if there's anything else in here. Uh, we talked about if they don't close on time, if they miss that seven day window, what's gonna happen? This is a big deal. This builder allows a a uh, per diem of if they allow the if they allow the extension in sellers sole and absolute discretion they charge one hundred dollars per day so you might have a, a, a daily per diem that your buyer can pay i would tell you that if you miss this more and your buyer misses it more often than not you end up being asked to foot this bill um, the buyers reach the end of their rope. It's been a long, arduous process. They are ready to move in. Again, maybe there's a baby on the way. It's just been, it's, 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 it's been an emotionally taxing event. The last thing they want to hear is they've got to pay $300 extra. Um, and especially if you went with your lender and not the preferred lender, um, you're going to have more latitude in a per diem scenario with preferred lender, preferred title. Um, but keep this in mind. I mean, a lot of builders do have an option and it's already built into the contract. Um, they don't want it up for discussion later uh, down the road. So um, warranties, we're going to skip. We've talked a little bit about that. Um, pre-construction closing costs. I mean, again, or excuse me, pre-construction closing walks. Most all builders are going to want that to be accompanied by the seller or a seller representative. Um, they're, they're trying to prohibit buyers from being out there every day, walking projects, talking to their subcontractors, trying to you know, do little side deals on things that they can pay attention to. Um, so they're gonna want you there. And um, one other item that was on this uh, as well, there's a section here for grade. Buyer understands that the seller reserves the right to decide the depth of the foundation. That's a pet peeve of mine and something that I would make sure that your clients are very aware of, especially in your you know, mid-level priced homes. Builders get lazy about shooting the right grade and getting the depth of their foundation in the ground. So your client loves the house because they've seen the brochure and they saw the model, but the brochure typically only shows like one step into the house. And then you go out to the subdivision and there's four steps into the front door um, or more. That's a problem. I would say that most of the time it's raised to meet grades for utilities and sewer and, um, and different requirements. But sometimes builders just miss it. They don't, or they don't put it in the ground enough because they don't want to pay the extra 2,500 bucks to dig it a foot and a half deeper. Um, so be aware in your pre-construction meeting to look at the grade of what that home will be above the grade or in the ground at. Um, I think that's gonna make all the decision um, in making sure that they have a great experience and they love the style of that home. Um, everything else is pretty boilerplate. The lar again, the large document goes through the same type of items, construction deposits, closings and title, preferred lender, lender programs, 
Um, it outlines the $500 in this one for a change order fee. Um, I don't think there was anything in, in the bigger one that needed to be really talked about more. Um, let me just peek and make sure I'm not missing something. And um, talked about, no. Um, the only other item on here, let me just two two items left on this. Item 15, property value. Basically, it's just saying, um, again, they're making no issue relating to an appraisal. Again, the word appraisal does not show up in the builder documents, uh, but they're making no representation. If your buyer picks more items, if you know they're on a lean budget and they're limping into this deal, help them be careful in getting too many upgrades in this home. If they miss the appraisal, they could have a problem. They're gonna have to bring in more cash. They don't have cash. They're putting a construction deposit at risk. It could be, it, it could just be a bad experience at the end. So be super careful in that. Um, and then always, always adjacent land uses. Number 18 in the large document. Um, be careful in telling your clients that there's a park next door um, or that it's open space scheduled on the five acres next to the project. Um, cities like to change their mind. Um, things change. And the last thing we want is some representation that uh, now there's a substation or a little power station or a two-story commercial building in their, back, in their backyard. So just be careful to stay away from those. Point them to the city. Let them have the conversations with the city so that you're out of that dialogue. Um, but I think overall, that pretty much um, completes all of the items that are in these documents to be aware of. So look, if you want to throw uh, any, you know, you got a question, throw a quick uh, chat on, uh, you know, in the, uh, in the chat section, let's answer a couple more. We've, I mean, we basically are ending, we've got about six minutes before our class can end. Um, and I don't want uh, Chrissy giving me the thumbs down later because I broke the rules with the division. So um, it's really good to see your guys' faces though. Any last questions? My hope is, again, going back to my, my original comment, um, my hope is that the takeaway is that you found some, you found something in here um, and, and you know, some information that'll help you educate your buyer and to be more prepared to help navigate this transaction in advance, looking out in front, projecting the problems, recognizing where the concerns are gonna be, having an in-depth conversation with your buyer before they go into models or right after they do meet with the model um, you know, some of it's going to be prior to, some of it after, to maybe clarify some of the comments that were made by a, by a sales agent while you're writing an offer. Um, but ultimately, if you can help prepare them, like I said earlier, emotionally, um, to be ready for this and to understand how these timeframes are going to work and to find a way to allow them uh, this process to be a good experience, it will just make you a better agent. Um, you'll have a, a better opportunity of showing your value to them and helping prepare them for the future. Um, it's real quick, Isabel has a question. She said, how involved are we supposed to be in going with the buyer to all their appointments? So like how yeah, much that's, a, that, yeah. that's a good question. I always recommend going the first, I don't, I, so I, that's a, probably a personal preference. I mean, I think as a brokerage, we'd love to tell you to go to all of them. I think it's important to go to obviously the contract meetings and those discussions. Um, I do not typically attend my buyer's meetings with specific suppliers. So if they're going to pick cabinets or they're going to pick, uh, countertops and features like that. I don't go to those events, um, but I do want to know a recap on what their budget was and their numbers were. I want to see documents before they're signed. Um, I want to be aware of that. But, but keep in mind, one of the ways to keep your buyers comfortable in this process is for them to hear from you first. So if you're hearing from your client all the time that they were just at the project and there's a problem and you hear that over and over, you may want to consider trying to get out in front of your client and being at the and, and touring the project and saying, Hey, a couple of quick, uh, you know, here, shoot them a text, a couple of quick photos. I was in the house today. You were asking in one of our last meetings about the fireplace. It's looking good. Here's a photo. When you do, when you get out in front with your buyers like that, they feel comfortable that someone else is looking at it and they're more likely to go there less often. So that's good. Even if you're a model agent representing a builder, reaching out to the agent and the client, the, the buyer. It's also good if you're representing only the buyer. Um, and then there's a question again, the examples or the differences between examples of addendums one and two. One's just a short format, 
One's a longer format. 90% uh, of the information, both of those are the same, just expanded a little more. Um, there's a few extra takeaways in there. Um, and then there's a question here on a new build. Is it typical the builder's responsibility to confirm road access and easements? Um, that, that's a loaded question. I would probably say no. Um, I mean, I'm trying to think of some properties that might be like a big Cottonwood Canyon that could be a new build, but you access over, um, you know, forest service to get to it. Um, that would, I mean, they're going to probably disclose to you that it's, that it's over, a, you know, an easement or a, a right of way. Um, again, and, and a lot of those confirmations for access generally would be explored in the permitting process. So, um, that's about the extent on that. Guys, anything else? Any last, last minute questions? Again, I don't expect you to ask any. The class is over. The two hours is done. Um, Allison, I will just get back to you directly if that's okay. I see a personal question to me. I'll just, since we're running out of time. Um, again, appreciate you guys being here. I'm concerned for your well being that so many of you would show up on a Friday morning, uh, but it's always good to see your smiling faces. Um, and thanks for being engaged. This is so tough. You know, it's hard to, it's, it, I, I see a few head nods and a few thumbs up here and there and, and thank you. Um, it's just, it's, uh, you feel like a, a teacher and a stand-up comedian with no reply. So these have been difficult, but hopefully educational. Um, and again, hopefully there's some great takeaways, but thanks for joining me. And if there's anything additional that you still want to dive in on, you've got a personal transaction you're working on that you want to dive into some of these details or help with, please reach out to me personally. Happy to to, to help answer more questions or get a little more involved in helping you guide this. So again, thanks everybody and uh, have a great Friday and a great weekend. We'll see you guys. Lance, that went really well. <laughs> it just feels like a lot of talking. <laughs> Joe needs to pipe in some applause music like they do on comedian shows because the audience never really laughs. It's just the piped in applause. I'm working on it like this. <laughs> hey, that's what we needed. Yeah, I've been trying to figure out how to like how to patch it in because the way that they do it in Zoom, you can't you have to share your sound when you're sharing your screen. So yeah. I can't, and so there's a there's some things like that. But look, I finally got this one, Lance. Oh, perfect. <laughs> nice. Perfect. And we need an applause cool one. You know, we yeah, need we gotta hit, hit the real one. Yeah. Nice. Wait, I awesome. got, and I got one for this for Will's classes. <laughs> we need a we need one for <laughs> Will's classes like a wah wah. Something like this. <laughs> when he tells us great yeah, the cricket's perfect. I, that, I think we need the cricket. You ask a question and nobody replies and you can throw the cricket on. And then every time Will's gonna, Will's gonna tell a joke, you know, on Tuesday, and we'll have to just have that. Wah, wah. Yeah, and then every time Kevin Cameron does something. <laughs> you, you, you guys have watched Kramer's Mad Money. No. We need the honking horns and the all. All sorts. He has all sorts of sounds on there. Oh, I got like this. <laughs> Jim Lee, it's really good to see you. I had to call you out there one time. So, how you been? Good, good. Jim, looks like a billion dollars, that man. Look at him. <laughs> All right, guys, I'm going to jump off. Yeah, Yay. you got to end it Thanks, so, can, so I can convert the record. I will right now. Bye, everybody. Stop. Have a good one.